Hi, my name is Matthew, and are you going to say hello? This is Sophie. And we, by the looks of it, are going to talk to you today about exponential and logarithmic equations. Would you please settle somewhere? That's convenient. Uh, I'm going to look with you at a few examples of some different scenarios that you might run into where you're either initially provided with an exponential or a logarithmic equation, or sometimes it's beneficial to sort of convert the equation that you're working with into one of those other forms. Let's have a look. All right, so the first thing we need to be aware of is that if you're working with an exponential equation and you can get the bases, in this case, right in the middle of your screen, you're seeing lowercase b to the power of m equals lowercase b to the power of n. So the lowercase b is your base in that scenario. And if you can get the bases on either side of the equation to be equal to each other, then you can set the exponents equal to each other. So let's see an example of where we might be able to make that happen. In example number one, we've got three to the two X plus one, <clears throat> excuse me, equals 27. So at the moment, the bases on the left and right side of the equation are not the same. However, Sophie's now up on a shelf. I'm just glancing up to make sure she's not eating something or she'll probably knock something over. So if there's a loud noise, don't be alarmed. Uh, what we'd like to do is get the bases to be equal to each other on both sides of the equation. So what I'm going to do is keep the left-hand side as it is and write it as 3 to the 2x plus 1. And on the right-hand side, I recognize that 27 is equivalent to 3 to the third power. Now that I have the bases equal to each other on both sides of the equation, I can equate the exponents or set the exponents equal to each other. So we can now write 2x plus 1 equals 3. And the 3 that I just wrote there is this 3 right here. And then solving from there is quite easy. Subtract 1 from both sides and divide both sides by 2. And we have the solution to our equation. If you want to write some additional notes on the right-hand side of this, uh, the very first thing we did changing 27 into 3 to the third, if you want to try to articulate what it is that you did there, uh, it's not a bad idea. One of the reasons why I try to only do one step at a time as I modify an equation and I try to keep everything lined up is so that visually you can just see what it is that changed. So in this case, the 27 changing into a 3 to the third. But for you to write some additional note, like um, rewrite 27 as 3 to the third, so both sides of the equation have the same base. It's a little long to write that out, but that is what we did, and it's why we did it. And the follow-up to why we did that was so that we could set the exponents equal to each other, which is really what we did in order to go from our first handwritten line down to our next handwritten line was we equated the exponents. And before Sophie jumps on the computer, let's give her a hand. Come here, baby. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. <laughs> All right. You've made it down in one piece. Good job. Say goodbye. Goodbye. She'll be back. And then after that, it was just arithmetic. Let's see what other trouble we can get into. All right, the next scenario we run into is one where it is not convenient to achieve the same base on both sides of the equation. And in order to solve an exponential equation that looks like this, we're going to use the natural log. So our first step, as it says in this blue box next to me here, is to isolate the exponential expression. And the exponential expression is the one that has a base being raised to a power that contains an exponent. 
So in this case, we've got e to the power of 7x. The 4 is not really part of that exponential expression. So the first thing we want to do is divide both sides by 4. And if we do, we get e to the 7x equals 2,568.25. And then somehow we need to get access to that variable that's in the exponent position. In fact, our final answer is going to say x equals but the x right now is in the exponent position. I need x to be down on the ground, as I like to say. So how is it that we're going to make that happen? And the answer is, we're going to take the natural log of both sides of this equation. So I'm gonna write out all of my work here. So first I'm just writing in that I'm taking the natural log of both sides. There we go. And one of the properties of natural logs says that we can take this exponent and bring it out in front of the natural log and write it there as a coefficient. And if we did that, the next thing we would do is to evaluate the natural log of e. But the natural log of e is equal to one. So what we end up with is seven x times one, which of course is just seven x. Now instead of using the power rule for logarithms in order to bring the 7x out front and write it like a coefficient, and then evaluating the natural log of e, because we know that that happens every time and the natural log of e turns into a one, so really you just end up with the exponent like we did here, we usually skip those two steps and roll it all into one and we say that the natural log and the e cancel out. It looks like they do, but what's really happening is those two different procedures. Power rule for natural log, or rather for logarithms, brings the 7x out front, and then the natural log of e equals one, 7x times one makes 7x. And the good news is now we've got that exponent, in, in particular the variable, down on the ground and out of that exponent position, and it is still equal to, in this case, the natural log of 2,568 0.25. We can then divide both sides by 7, and we're going to be one step away from our final answer. What I'm doing here, by writing this all out, is I am getting this solution calculator ready. So I've done everything using paper and pencil that I possibly can, and at this point the only next step is to type this into a calculator which of course I don't have sitting up here next to me yet, but I will. Let's use two calculators. Other people would put a little cut in their video there and take out the part where they forgot their calculators. Not I. This is one take kind of material here. It's the real life. I'm at home. I'm in the office, which is the guest room. And I'm hanging out with you doing math. All right, so if you're using A, and if you're allowed to use a graphing calculator in whatever course you're taking, this is pretty straightforward. We can, so I'm using a TI-84, we can pretty much type this in from left to right. So I'm gonna uh, hit the natural log button, which is in the left-hand column, um, more than halfway down, so there it is. Natural log, it automatically puts in a parenthesis for me. I'm typing in the 25, 68.25, I'm closing the parentheses, and then I'm hitting the divided by button, seven, and then enter. And I get an answer of x equals 1.12, uh, let's see, then use a calculator to obtain a decimal approximation correct to two decimal places. So 1.12. And we could change that equal sign to a sort of squiggly equal sign to indicate that this is an approximate solution. One of the dangers, I suppose you could say, and it's difficult to see on here because my, I'm not using the, uh, the built-in webcam on my computer, so it's not automatically focusing and adjusting to brightness and things like that, but where I divided by seven on my screen here, which is admittedly difficult to see, um, 
there's the possibility that the 2568.25 could be divided by 7 first, and then we take the natural log of it. I tried to avoid that by putting the 2568.25 in parentheses so that the natural log would be taken of that value and then the division by 7 would occur. And on the graphing calculator, I trust that that happened. Now, what this is, is a single line entry scientific calculator. It's a TI-30XA. And in order to get a solution out of this calculator, we have to do things a little bit backwards. So be careful, depending on what calculator you're using. On this calculator, I'm going to type in the 2568.25, and then I'm going to hit the natural log button, which is up in the top row here. And immediately it gives me uh, a value on my screen of 7.85, etc., etc. And then I'm going to hit divided by, and then 7, and then equals, and I do indeed get the same answer that I did from my graphing calculator. So if you're using a single line entry scientific calculator, you might want to take notes on the order of the keystrokes necessary in order to get this as your final answer, because that is the correct answer. If you're using a scientific calculator that has two lines of entry, so it's a screen where you end up seeing two lines of numerical values, uh, one above the other, like if you did two plus two equals or enter, on the next line, you would see the answer of four. So you would see the two plus two and the four on the same screen at the same time. If that's the kind of scientific calculator you're using, you can probably just type this expression in the same way you would on the graphing calculator. Just type it in from left to right. You might have to put in your own parentheses. So make sure that that 2568.25 is in parentheses after the natural log and then divide by seven or Essentially, do what ended up happening on this scientific calculator. Get yourself that initial uh, value from taking the natural log of 2568.25. Get that solution up on your screen and then hit divided by 7 in order to get your final answer. All right, we just talked about two different kinds of calculators or three different kinds of calculators, five different ways. That part of the conversation took almost as long as it did to solve the problem but I wanna make sure that you're prepared to use the tools that you have available. All right, so here we are in our next little subtopic, logarithmic equations. And it's a very important, at least as far as your success in an algebra course, and if you're gonna be going on and studying some additional math after this, that you are aware of how to make this transformation. So what we're seeing here are two different equations the one on the left is a logarithmic equation. The one on the right is an exponential equation. And these two equations are equivalent. They are two different ways of writing the same thing. And it's very possible that you're gonna be asked to convert, from, uh, convert one equation into the other type of equation, from logarithmic to exponential or exponential to logarithmic. So. My recommendation is to standardize this process for yourself as much as possible. And I will show you what I mean as we go through and work one of these problems. But the first thing that's happening on this slide is we're seeing and, and sort of matching up the components. You can see that the lowercase b in the logarithmic equation is the base of the log, and it's the base holding up the exponent in the exponential equation. Now it's a little tricky because the C value in the logarithmic equation ends up in the exponent position. How it is that you commit that to memory is up to you, but it does need to be committed to memory. And then finally, the M we're seeing is sort of the argument of the logarithm, and over here it's the answer to our exponential equation. Whether that goes on a flashcard or in a Quizlet or you use a dry erase marker and write it on your bathroom mirror so that you see it every time you're brushing your teeth or washing your face, whatever, please commit that one to memory. Also remember that when you're working with a logarithmic equation, you can't take the log of anything other than a positive number. So M, which is the argument there in the logarithmic equation, 
must be strictly greater than zero. Cannot be zero. Must be actually greater than zero. Positive number. Okay, so let's check out an example now that we see that those two forms of an equation are equal to each other. In this problem, example three, we're going to bring back one of the properties that we saw when we first studied logarithms, which is the product rule, or in this case, sort of a reverse product rule. So on the left-hand side of equation, of this equation, because I have a log base six plus log base six, I can consolidate the left-hand side of my equation and write it as log base six of, and if you'd like, you could put square brackets here to really illustrate that the x plus five, which is now being multiplied by the x from the second logarithm, become this sort of larger argument of a new logarithm. So we still have log base six, but we're taking the argument from our first log and the argument from the second log and we're multiplying them together inside of this one log. And that is what I like to call the reverse product rule. Usually when we teach the product rule, we're taking something like this, which has a product in it, and we split it up into these two separate logarithms. But in this case, we're consolidating them, so I call it reverse product rule. That is still equal to the two on the right-hand side of the equation. So if you wanna put a little note over here that says reverse product rule, that's how we got from up there to down here, not a bad idea. The next thing we'll do is use this property that we were seeing on the previous slide, which allows us to convert from a logarithmic equation to an exponential equation. So we're going this way. Let's see what we get. So when I read this equation, here's how I read it. I start with my base of six and it's gonna hold up my exponent, which is the two. So six to the second power equals, and then this argument, all of it, is gonna be my answer. So we have six to the second power equals x plus five times x. Other than working a bunch of practice problems, and making that conversion for yourself, not just reading problems that already have the solution worked out. I'm talking about actually doing problems where you have to convert from logarithmic to exponential. I don't know of a great way to make sure that you're adept at doing what I just did accurately. So make sure you get some practice in on making that conversion. And now we need to clean this thing up. So I've got 36 on the left-hand side is equal to, and I'm gonna distribute the multiplication by x from the right which gives me x squared plus 5x, and I am allowed to distribute from the right. And then I'm gonna subtract 36 from both sides in order to zero out one side of my equation. And now that I have this quadratic looking equation, I can factor on the right hand side. I need two numbers that multiply to negative 36 and add to positive five. My options are one and 36, two and 18, three and 12. And what comes after that? How about four times nine? Nine, 18, 36, I think four and nine work. So both of these parentheses are going to lead with an x because x times x makes the x squared. I know that I'm going to have a nine and a four but their signs have to be opposite from each other. So it's either a positive nine and a negative four or a negative nine and a positive four. But when I add those two numbers together, it needs to equal positive five for the positive five X. So that I know then that the nine is gonna be positive and the four is gonna be negative. You could always check to make sure that you factored correctly just now by foiling this back out. If you multiply this out and combine like terms, it's the positive 9x and the negative 4x that will add together 
the O and the I terms will add together to give you the positive 5x. All right, so let's solve this now. Um, in order to make this equation true, either x plus 9 needs to equal 0, or x minus 4 needs to equal 0. To make either one of those things happen, either x needs to equal negative 9, or x needs to equal positive 4. Could we possibly go any further than that? I feel like we've been spending a lot of time on this question already. Are those my two solutions? If you're taking a multiple choice test, or if you're doing a homework assignment where your answer options are multiple choice, it's very probable that one of the multiple choice options is going to have negative 9 and positive 4, both as a solution. But we don't know that those are solutions yet. We really need to take those and plug them back into the original equation and make sure that they work. And I think we can fit the whole problem on one screen. Sure enough, there we go. So right at the top of the screen, let's take our x value of negative 9 and plug it in for our x value. Uh, yep, there we go, there and there. Negative 9 going into that first x position, negative 9 plus 5 makes negative 4, and you cannot take the log of a negative number. So a log of negative 4 is out of the question. It conflicts with the domain restrictions of the logarithmic function, and so negative 9 is not an option. And you should put a little note maybe that says domain conflict or uh, can't use negative 9 because it causes me to take the log of a negative number <clears throat> or something. Phrase it in your own words so that when you're going back through your notes, you're reminded of why you were not allowed to use that x value of negative 9. And then we try the x value of positive 4. 4 plus 5 makes positive 9. That's fine. Log base 6 of 4. That's fine. Just as far as checking to make sure that we're not having a conflict with the domain of the log function. In other words, just checking to make sure that we don't end up taking the log of a negative number. It looks like x equals positive 4 works. And in fact, it does. So I'm going to put a box around that and call that my one and only final answer of x equals positive 4. If you run into a scenario where you have the log, uh, a log on the left hand side and the right hand side of an equation and those two logs have the same base as we're seeing in this equation here, you can set their arguments equal to each other. In this case, m would equal n. Of course, m and n both need to be positive values because log equations must have positive arguments. So let's see, is that the case here? I see log of x to the third equals log of 64. Do these two logs have the same base is my first question. And the answer is yes, just as a reminder in case you don't recall, if you see log written without a visible base, then we assume that there's right here and right here we assume that there's a base of 10. So the log button on your calculator that actually says LOG, that has a base of 10. The only other time that we assume the base of a logarithm is when we're working with the natural log of something. This is equivalent to log base E of whatever that value is. So natural log, we assume a base of E. But that's not what we're working with here. That's a true statement that I had written and just scribbled out, but it doesn't really apply here. In fact, let's just make that go away. And now that we see that the equation that we've been given here does have a log of base 10 on both sides, we can set the arguments equal to each other. x to the third equals 64. I was already thinking exponents, so I wrote that 4 in the exponent position. x to the third equals 64. There are a number of ways to solve this. One way is to go into your calculator and try numbers. 1 times 1 times 1. In other words, 1 to the third power. Does that equal 64? It does not. 2 times 2 times 2. 3 times 3 times 3, and so on. Eventually, you'll get to an x value of 4, or if you do have 
uh, if you're in a multiple choice situation like we are here, you start with the smallest number and try four times four times four, you'll find that it is 64. So the correct answer here is x equals four. But if part of the strategy that you need from this lesson is if I end up with an equation that says x to the third equals 64, how in the world am I supposed to find that x value? One option is trial and error, start plugging in numbers. Another option is we need to get rid of the three in the exponent position. And a way that you can do that is by raising both sides of this equation to the one third power. And if you know how to use your calculator to type in fractional exponents or rational exponents, then you could type in 64 to the one third power and you would get an answer of four. And here we're seeing our x value raised to a power raised to another power. And when you have a thing to a power to a power, you can multiply those powers together. And of course, three times one third equals one. So you end up with x to the first power equals positive four. So that's another good way to get your answer. And finally, I recognize that 64 is four to the third power. If I just go into this equation and I match up the pieces, the exponent is the exponent, so the base must be the base, which means the x must be the four, x equals four. Or you could take this equation and raise both sides to the one third power in order to get rid of the exponents. So a lot of options, all right? Use whatever it is that's gonna work most reliably for you. And I do believe, yes. So there are application problems that are available. Whatever textbook you're using, you could pop into there and look at some example problems that are applied problems or word problems. At the end of your section or in the appendix, you should be able to find answers. There are other videos where you can go and look for exponential problems and logarithmic uh, application problems. I'm just not covering them in this video. However, my hope is that this gives you a good start and a good introduction to the relationship between exponential functions, logarithmic functions, logarithmic equations, and how to convert back and forth between the two of them. All right, that's it. I'm out. Thanks for hanging with me. See you next time.